Hi there, my dear friends uh, and uh, loyal uh, followers of this YouTube upload. Uh, to be honest with you, I already finished uploading this uh, the whole morning. For some reason, I must have pump, punched the wrong button. I could not locate the file, so now I'll have to, to uh, record it again for you. This is uh, the political law bar problem on September 2023. And I find uh, that this is a tough uh, <clears throat> bar exam for uh, the 2023. Perhaps uh, even more difficult than uh, the uh, uh, remedial law exam that I have uploaded. I'd like to, uh, with your permission, it's now about uh, 15 minutes before 5 o'clock. Uh, this is uh, Friday, October 27, 2023. And I'd like to dedicate this to my associates uh, in the 1980s. I am particularly dedicating this to my uh, most favorite uh, superior, the president and general manager of uh, Asia Pacific Agricultural Development Corporation, we were selling Furadan of FMC, and Clemencio uh, Clem Peña was our president and general manager. I report directly to him, and for years he has accepted me as a young friend and I have accepted him as a more senior friend. It's not only my boss but uh, really my friend. Almost in the same relationship as my father, uh, Captain Santos Biscera. he was not only my father, he was also my personal friend. And so you, you have people like those in your life that uh, have uh, come so close to your heart that you will never forget them. The other one uh, is another very sincere and very impressive person by the name of Armando J. Achenza. We call him Armando Aja. And he was our marketing manager. He's a typical uh, idol, uh, what they call this, idol of, uh, of a graduate of UP Los Baños. Uh, he graduated uh, as an agriculturist and I saw uh, he was the one who impressed me that agriculture uh, is a very noble and a very challenging profession. It was in him that I saw the use of statistics, the treatment of agriculture uh, as, as a manufacturing component. And uh, I learned a lot from them. I thought it was the uh, klase ng pamumuhay, hindi pala, eh, kailangan pala doon talaga, matalino ka, at ginagamit mo. And that's the reason perhaps why uh, we, we, we progress in our Masagana 99 under President Ferdinand Marcos because we really use technology and science in uh, uh, revitalizing and uh, improving our rice production. I just don't know why... Uh, uh, President Bongbong Marcos could not find the right combination of people who, whom his father had uh, when we were we started exporting rice in the, uh, to, to other countries in Asia. And the one I'd like to also give uh, credit is our FMC Regional Director Dick Hendrickson. Uh, and Dick uh, claim reports to Dick Hendrickson and uh, Dick uh, has uh, equally shown his fondness for me. He's an American and uh, all those years that uh, I have worked with them, uh, Clem and Dick are not necessarily uh, bosom friends but uh, I love uh, Clem so much and Dick is also a very good friend who has respected me so much. And they, uh, in the process, I become the middle ground where <laughs> Dick thinks I, I, I can be his spy on Clem, and Clem knows that I have been a very loyal 
uh, friend to him that I, I was not there to put him down. I would always uh, like to give him uh, uh, that kind of support. And Arman has always been there as part. I, I will talk about uh, them uh, at the end of this uh, lecture when after you have already listened to political law. Uh, if you want to already cut off the discussion, then you're free. But if you want to listen to some of my sharing, then you can continue to watch. That would probably be a little, some, some few extras. Okay, so without uh, much ado, let us now start uh, the political law uh, bar exams of September 2023. As usual, we have here our beautiful map. It's a circular map which allows us to see the complete picture of political law in the bar exams of 2023. Uh, these were the major coverages of that political law bar exams. And the, uh, the most number of questions were asked in the Bill of Rights, followed by election law, uh, five Bill of Rights questions, uh, four questions on election law, three questions on the executive department, and equally three questions on the local government, two questions on public international law, and one question each on the principles and state policies in the Constitution, one in, for the legislature, and the other one for the judiciary. And uh, I will cover now the subject matter according to the number of questions that were asked in that group. So we will start with the Bill of Rights. The five questions on the Bill of Rights covered the following subjects. There was a question on checkpoints and unreasonable search. There was a question on search of office computers. A question on separation of church and state expropriation and compensation and the right to counsel in a preliminary investigation. As a matter of preference, let me pick up this very interesting subject matter on the separation of church and state. In this particular uh, problem, it was problem number 10 where the separation of church and state and the establishment clause was asked. The question runs like this. The Secretary of the Department of Education, that Ed, issued Department Order DO number 35, providing guidelines for teaching good manners and right conduct in all primary educational institutions. As part of the materials to be used during the sessions, the Handbook for Instructors contains a chapter on values from religious traditions and indigenous cultures. The Debt Ed will provide the handbooks, but educational institutions shall be free to adopt the contents of the handbook in accordance with the respective mission and vision. Attendance at the session shall be compulsory for all students. Concerned parents and teachers questioned DO number 35 before the Supreme Court as being violative of the Establishment Clause and their primary right and duty to rear their children. Are the parents and teachers correct? Explain briefly. Our suggested answer. The parents and teachers are not correct. The Department Order Number 35 does not violate the Establishment Clause on the separation of church and state. There is also no violation of the right and duty to rear their children. Continuing now, the Debt and Order 35 deals with teaching good manners and right conduct. It sponsors no religion nor favor any religion against other religions. Said order is strictly neutral in affairs among religious groups. In the Supreme Court uh, issuance to the Office of the Court Administrator, in a memorandum dated uh, 2014, 
the Supreme Court had the opportunity to uh, define the separation of church and state involving two clauses. The first is the Establishment Clause, and the second one is the Free Exercise Clause. In the Establishment Clause, uh, the Constitution prohibits the state from sponsoring any religion or favoring any religion as against other religions. It mandates a strict neutrality in affairs among religious groups. On the other hand, the Free Exercise uh, Clause says that the state cannot prohibit anyone from freely choosing his religion. Parenthetically, that includes also a person who doesn't choose any religion and therefore would be considered an atheist. Continuing now, the Supreme Court in the same uh, memorandum defined benevolent neutrality as recognizing that religion plays an important role in the public life. In this area, there are two aspects that were brought up. The approach of strict separation and the approach of strict neutrality. In strict separation, the intention is to protect the state from the church and the state's hostility towards religion allows no interaction between the two. In the case of strict neutrality, the wall of separation does not require the state to be religion's adversary. Okay. Well, the story of separation of church and state goes back a long, long uh, way in our Philippine history. And if you remember the uh, very embarrassing, scandalous, and uh, grave uh, abuse of the Spanish friars when this country was run for 350 years by the Spaniards. With the threat of uh, excommunication, all the lay Spanish leaders were under the, uh, in effect, under the dictates of the friars, which uh, Rizal uh, epitomized in his uh, No Limitangere as, he, as Padre Damaso. And we know from our history that the abuses of the Spanish friars reach its, uh, what do you call this, its highest uh, uh, point when the three uh, Filipino priests, uh, Father uh, Gomez, Father Burgos, and Father Samora, were executed uh, essentially because they are threats to the uh, rule of the Spanish uh, friars in running this country. And the example, uh, the bad example of, of executing these three priests became a rallying point for many of the young Filipino uh, uh, patriots at that time, uh, spearheaded by no less than Jose Rizal and Andres Bonifacio. And obviously, uh, we finally rebelled against Spain. And uh, historically, therefore, we have always been wary of the church uh, meddling into the affairs of governance. Well, uh, during the time of uh, Ferdinand Marcos, the church, uh, Catholic Church, became so uh, vocal against him that the uh, homilies in pulpits were being used to attack directly Ferdinand Marcos, and uh, this was uh, no less than spearheaded by the then uh, Cardinal uh, Sin uh, and uh, his group of uh, loyal priests. Well, uh, let us hope that uh, the, the confrontation between church and state no longer happens. The classic question is, uh, can, can, the, uh, can the church, using the uh, homilies and pulpits, uh, become abrasive uh, without violating the principle of separation of church and state? It appears that the Bill of Rights uh, enshrined by our uh, people were addressed more to ensuring that the government 
does not uh, take any untoward uh, antagonism against the church. Neither uh, is the government encouraged to support any uh, religion. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the church uh, has uh, in a number of instances taken some very uh, aggressive and uh, antagonistic approach, especially during the time of Marcos and the Catholic Church and the uh, priests and nuns have been labeled to be part of the yellow tribe in the Philippines. Uh, there have not been any uh, serious issues on the uh, state persecuting the church, except that every now and then some priests uh, take a more active role in the underground movement uh, and uh, th therefore they, they show their rebellious uh, behavior against the, the state. Now the very interesting question is can priests or even nuns participate in the uh, political exercise of the country and uh, notably to even uh, run for public positions and we have seen this happen. The most uh, uh, famous of which is the a governor of Pampanga, who used to be uh, uh, the uh, Paris priest of one of the leading uh, parishes in Pampanga. He became, uh, see, Father uh, Panlilio became even the governor. And so uh, he, he was a Catholic priest who started actively participating in the affairs of government. Of course, the Catholic hierarchy uh, strongly encouraged him to give up his priestly duties uh, while he was still performing some political uh, duties. So uh, that is uh, the first question that we handle and that is in the Bill of Rights in the issue of separation of church and state. Let us now go to some of the very sensitive issues on checkpoints, uh, uh, search without warrants, and the right of uh, an accused to waive his uh, right for counsel. So in the case of checkpoints on unreasonable search, this is now the problem that was given in the bar exams. Problem number eight on unreasonable search and seizure when the checkpoint required in this particular case probable cause. The question runs like this. A public transport bus was stopped by the police at a checkpoint. All male passengers were asked to disembark while all female passengers were requested to remain seated. Paul, a police officer, then boarded the bus and upon cursory inspection noticed a suspicious bulging black bag at the rear of the bus. Paul lifted the bag and found it to be heavy for its size. Severino, the owner of the bag and an unpaying passenger, consented to have it open, and it was revealed that the bag contained a firearm and a live grenade. When Severino failed to produce proof of his authority to carry firearms and explosives, he was arrested and eventually charged with illegal possession of firearms and explosives. Severino now contends that the search was unreasonable and unconstitutional as it was done without a search warrant. Is Severino correct? Explain. Our suggested answer, yes, Severino is correct. The checkpoint was established with no probable cause. There were no suspicious circumstances to validly set up a lawful checkpoint. The search with no warrant at an unlawful checkpoint violated Severino's constitutional right against unreasonable search. A warrantless search and subsequent arrest of the accused were illegal because there was no sufficient and reasonable ground to believe that Puwa and Lee had submitted a, a crime at the point of search and arrest. The alleged tips received is hearsay information that cannot bring about probable cause. 
this was how the Supreme Court uh, made the pronouncement in the case of Evardo versus People, a 2021 decision. Among us, uh, the more important one is when the unlawful uh, checkpoint brought about the unlawful search, the uh, discovered firearm and explosive would therefore not be admissible in evidence because they were not, uh, they, 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 they were, uh, uh, what they call this, uh, uh, so, so they were seized, they were picked up by the police uh, in a checkpoint which was not set up arising from a probable cause. And so without the evidence uh, being admissible uh, in presentation uh, during the uh, prosecution of the case, there will be no, uh, what you call this, object evidences in order to establish that uh, Severino was in unlawful or illegal possession of said firearms and explosives. Because if that particular firearm and explosive is inadmissible in evidence, therefore that particular firearm and explosive is non-existent at the time of the trial. And so there will not be any basis at all. Uh, in reality, we, we, we can even say now that though the firearm and the explosive happens to be the... Uh, the corpus delicti of the crime. Oh, those are the evidences that would comprise the, the substance or the essence of the legal possession. And so without the firearm and the explosive being legally recognized during the trial, then there is no evidence at all which we call absence of corpus delicti. Yan ang ibig sabihin ng corpus delicti. Uh, there is uh, an additional note here. It says, uh, A warrantless intrusive search of a moving vehicle cannot be premised solely on an initial tip. It must be founded on probable cause where there must be a confluence of several suspicious circumstances. Each circumstance, the cause for the search, must occur before the search is commenced. The circumstances must each be independently suspicious. When the law enforcers are predisposed to perceive guilt, as when specific persons are the targets of checkpoints, patrols, and similar operations, their subjective perception cannot anchor probable cause. That is lifting from the uh, what we mentioned as uh, the Evardo versus People case of May, May 2021. It was earlier uh, pronounced in the case of People versus Sapla, a 2020 decision, and also much earlier People versus Janson, a 2019 decision. And so we move now, that is, that is on the issue of the checkpoint. We now move to another subject matter in the matter of uh, uh, Bill of Rights. It would be interesting to look at what happens now in the case of a person who is uh, arrested without any uh, warrant of arrest. And uh, while he is in preliminary investigation, he was read his Miranda rights. And he said, I know that because I'm a law student. I, I, know, I, I waive my, my right. So let us take a look at the uh, impact of that on the right to counsel of an accused person. In problem number 12, it reads, and this is covering preliminary investigation and the waiver of the right to counsel. The problem, Ricardo, a third year law student, was subjected to custodial investigation for the crime of rape. He was duly informed by the police of his right to remain silent and his right to have counsel of his choice if he could afford one. And if not, he could be provided with one. Ricardo proudly informed the arresting officer that he is perfectly aware of his rights being a law student and that he is voluntarily waiving them. He then proceeded to issue a written statement 
truthfully detailing his participation in the crime of rape. During trial, his written statement was presented as the primary evidence of his guilt. Attorney Alexander, counsel for Ricardo, promptly and vociferously objected to the presentation and admissibility of his written statement on the ground that Ricardo executed it without assistance of counsel. Is the objection justified and tenable? Explain briefly. Our suggested answer. Attorney's Alexander objection is justified and tenable. Ricardo's waiver of his right to counsel as accused in the custodial investigation can be waived only in writing and in the presence of his counsel. So two requirements in order that the waiver of the accused will be accepted in court. That is number one, he made the waiver in writing. And at the time he was waiving the waiver, preferably his counsel was there and the counsel equally signed for the waiver. Without the elements of these two uh, components of uh, being in writing and uh, uh, in the presence of counsel, the waiver of his right to counsel will not be binding. And so any statement that comes out of the custodial investigation will be uh, can be contested in court, as what has happened here. There is no showing that Ricardo's waiver was made in writing and that his counsel, Attorney Alexander, was present when he made this written waiver. His written statement about his participation in the rape is not admissible in evidence for absence of counsel. Under Section 12, Paragraph 1 of Article 3 of the Bill of Rights, it says, any person under investigation for the commission of an offense shall have the right to be informed of his right to remain silent, liberando doctrine, and to have competent and independent counsel, preferably of his own choice. If the person cannot afford the services of counsel, he must be provided with one. These rights cannot be waived except in writing and in the presence of counsel. That is very clearly spelled out in Section 12, Paragraph 1 of Article 3 of the Bill of Rights. Continuing with our observation here, it says, The right to counsel may be waived, but the waiver shall not be valid unless made with the assistance of counsel. Any statement obtained in violation of the procedure herein laid down, whether exculpatory or inculpatory, in whole or in part, shall be inadmissible in evidence. This was uh, enshrined in the case of People versus Lidia Rama and citing Morales versus Ponce Enrile, uh, a 1983 decision. The uh, Rama decision was made in 1990. Ito, maganda rito eh. Because this Rama was arrested for kidnapping a little child of about 8 years old. And so, uh, when she was arrested, after the child was found in one of the houses uh, in, uh, in the Muslim area in, um, in Quiapo, during the investigation, uh, she admitted having kidnapped the child. And he said, para matapos na lang, sige. Uh, Inaamin ko na kinitap ko yung bata. That kind of admission uh, was not uh, was was done without the uh, not in writing, you know, and uh, the waiver of the right uh, was not witnessed by her counsel. So that particular thing is not visible. That is the right of an accused to have counsel for to have a a valid waiver. The next question is very interesting. Can somebody just uh, go into your uh, own uh, office computer and start searching without your clearance or without any search warrant? Let's take a look at this particular problem given in the bar exams. And this was uh, the question under uh, unreasonable search and seizure. Problem number nine. And it reads... For purposes of the investigation of work-related misconduct, 
the Presidential Management Staff search the office computer of its employees in Ida without the consent of the latter and without the search warrant. The personal files of Sinaida stored in the computer, which were seized during the search, were eventually used by the PMS as evidence of this conduct. Sinaida was accordingly dismissed from service. Sinaida now comes to you for advice, claiming that the search was unconstitutional for being violative of her right to privacy and right against unreasonable searches and seizures. Provide your legal advice with reasons. Our suggested answer. The search of Sinaida's computer, with no search warrant and without her consent, did not violate her privacy and right against unreasonable searches and seizures. Tingnan nyo ha? It did not violate <laughs> her right on unreasonable searches and seizures. In the case of uh, Bricio A. Polia, Polio, versus uh, Civil Service Commission Chairman Karina Constantino David, a 2011 decision, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to say that a search by a government employer of an employee's office is justified at inception when there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that it will turn out evidence that the employee is guilty of work-related misconduct. The Civil Service Commission pursued the search in its capacity as a government employer and that it was undertaken in connection with an investigation involving work-related misconduct. One of the circumstances exempted from the warrant requirement. Let's take a look if there is any additional comment here. There seems to be none, so... Uh, we go back to our original setup. Now, some of you may be asking, the, this, this, the setting here is that the employer is a government uh, office. Now, will this particular thing hold water if it were in the private sector? You know, uh, in the private sector, what we do is we issue uh, discipline memorandas and even... Uh, bind them in uh, what you call this in, in employees manuals specifying precisely that office computers and equipment are to be exclusively used in performing work related activities and that personal activities will be viewed as uh, an authorized use of the computer almost similar to tech because you are using the equipment for purposes other than uh, the the uh, assigned work that, that you are supposed to perform. So it's not only uh, using by virtue of uh, TEP, the principle of TEP, another person's property without uh, his permission. It is also uh, uh, dishonesty and probably also TEP because you are under uh, uh, employment and your time is being paid, and yet you're using it for a purpose other than the official business. So that is how uh, in the private sector, there is also that uh, tendency to uh, go to your computer, and you cannot complain on privacy and unreasonable search, because that computer is an office equipment, and therefore the office itself, has the prerogative to use its own equipment, including going into it and taking care of your files. More so if the purpose is a work-related misconduct or uh, an offense. Okay. Now, the last question on the Bill of Rights is in the exercise of the right of eminent domain and the corresponding expropriation. Let's take a look. Remember uh, that uh, the three inherent powers of the state are represented by the abbreviation PEP, P-E-T, is the inherent power of uh, inherent police power, Inher uh, that is for P, the inherent power of eminent domain, that is E, and T is the uh, inherent power of taxation. That with 
or without a constitution, these inherent powers are automatically in place. The moment there is a uh, uh, the, the presence of the four elements of state, the people, territory, uh, government, and sovereignty. So going now to the uh, second inherent power, uh, sovereign power, which is the power of eminent domain, and the uh, step of expropriation, but requiring just compensation in our constitution, Problem 11 reads like this. The property of Anne was expropriated by the government for public use more than 10 years ago without proper expropriation proceedings and without payment of just compensation. Since then, the value of the Philippine peso has greatly depreciated while the inflation rate has substantially increased. Anne now contends that in the interest of justice and fair play, the inflation rate and the depreciated value of the peso should be taken into consideration in the computation and payment of her long-delayed just compensation. Is incorrect. Explain briefly. Our suggested answer, yes, Ann is correct on the depreciated value of the Philippine peso and the inflation rate in giving her just compensation for her expropriated property. She is entitled to receive interest income on the compensation due to her when government took over her property until full compensation is paid. Her interest earnings shall cover all the incomes she deserves to earn to include the appreciation of her property value arising from the peso depreciation and the inflation rate. In Section 9 of Article 3 of the Bill of Rights, it says, Private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. And so in the case of Evergreen Manufacturing versus DPWH, a 2017 decision, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to say that just compensation in expropriation cases is the full and fair equivalent of the property taken from its owner by the expropriator. The true measure of just compensation is the owner's loss. The word just modifies the word compensation that the equivalent to be given for the property to be taken shall be real, substantial, full, and ample. Let us take a look at some additional comments on that one. In the case, the same case of Evergreen Manufacturing versus DPWH, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to say that when the taking of the property precedes the filing of the complaint or expropriation, as what happened in this case, the Supreme Court orders the condemnor to pay the full amount of just compensation from the date of the taking, whose interest shall likewise commence on the same date. So that if the property was taken 10 years ago, the compensation will be at the value of the property taken 10 years ago. However, take note, from that particular point on, that amount that is due to be determined by the courts will now be entitled to earn interest incomes you know, for, the next, for the subsequent 10 years and up to this point when the compensation has not been paid. And that will therefore allow the accumulation of values representing the annual interest rate, originally at 12%, now down to, uh, to, to 6%. But that would still be the uh, so-called measurement of the increase in the value of the property arising from inflation and arising from the deterioration of the peso value. And so that is exactly what uh, we have covered in the Bill of Rights. So the questions in the Bill of Rights that we have, uh, we have uh, taken up would be five. The checkpoints uh, should be based on probable cause. Search, the search for office computer need not, uh, can be without a search warrant. Uh, if the uh, reason for the search is a work-related misconduct. 
in the case of separation of church and state, the government can sponsor, you know, uh, programs in education dealing with right, uh, good manners and right conduct. And for as long as there is no religion that is favored uh, along those programs, then the, there is no violation of the uh, uh, restriction on separation of church and state. And then in the area of expropriation and compensation, the government is supposed to uh, pay just compensation to whoever is the uh, owner of the private property taken for public use. And to compensate for the uh, lost value, uh, including uh, the capital gains that should have made, that they should have uh, earned out of the time when the property was taken up to the time the compensation was paid, you know, the increase in value, plus any incomes that could have been earned out of rental, and all other damages will be taken care of by allowing the computation of interest on the compensation determined at the point of taking and the interest accumulating over a period until such time that the full compensation is paid. And finally, uh, the uh, right to counsel can be waived, provided the waiver is in writing and made in the presence of counsel. So those are the five questions uh, in uh, the Bill of Rights in the political law uh, bar problem. <clears throat> if we go back now to our uh, circular map, we are now uh, looking into election law as the source of four uh, questions on the bar. And so let us take a look at these four questions for purposes of understanding what they are and what is our response to them. The first question is something to do with the Bangsamoro Parliament. Second question is something to do with condonation of the uh, offense, administrative offense of a uh, an elected, employ, uh, an elected ofi official if re-elected re for the subsequent term. Third, when does a candidate uh, lose? Uh, his, when is he considered resigned if he files a uh, certificate of candidacy? And finally, is the requirement of the COMELEC on the submission of the voter for his biometrics a violation of his constitutional right? Here, I would prefer to zero in on the second question, which is the condemnation on the election. Here, the very beautiful question has something to do with uh, an ombudsman's case involving the condonation document. In number 14, the question runs like this. Lorenzo was re-elected as mayor of Roa City for his third consecutive term in the 2022 local elections. So he was uh, he was mayor for the second ter term uh, ending in 2022. So if you give him uh, how many years? Three years? Uh, as, as, as mayor, then he, was, he could have been elected for uh, 2022 minus 3, that is 2019. And if that is his second term, he had even his first term uh, in uh, 192016. Okay. Now, the question is, in 2023, that is his third term, Lorenzo was administratively charged before the office of the Ombudsman for acts committed during his second term which ended in 2022. No? So he must have committed some administrative uh, offenses and he was charged on his third term but referring to his performance or, or uh, commitment of the offense on the second year, which ended 2022. Lorenzo moved to dismiss the complaint before the OMB on the ground that his re-election of a third term effectively exonerated him from the administrative charge pursuant to the condonation doctrine. Is Lorenzo correct? Explain briefly. So he's saying, this is my third term. If you are now administratively charging me for an offense, referring to my second term, which ended in 2022, you cannot charge me anymore because the people have already forgiven me by re-electing me on the subsequent third year term. Okay, so is he correct? That is the question. 
Ang suggested answer. Lorenzo is not correct. His re-election to his third term did not exonerate him, you know, did not exonerate the administrative charges against him during his second term. He can no longer benefit from the condemnation doctrine abandoned in 2016. In effect, the Supreme Court uh, in 2016, April 2016, said that if you are uh, if you are a uh, what they call this an elected official and you are charged now for an offense, administrative offense, when you were the incumbent uh, official, that particular uh, condonation applies when the uh, when the administrative charge is filed against you, you know. Uh, during the time that the condonation doctrine was still in place up to April 2016. So if you are uh, in office up to 2016 and you are now being charged with administrative uh, offense after April 2016 but the incident happened before April 2016 then you can still say that if you were elected after 2016, then you can say the people have forgiven me because they elected me for the subsequent term. So the accused, the, your your criminal uh, prosecute, I mean uh, administrative prosecution against me uh, on the term before my subsequent election will no longer apply. Ayan. provided you look at the uh, the, the cut off point there. The Supreme Court abandoned the condemnation doctrine on April 12, 2016. Lorenzo can be criminally prosecuted for offenses he committed during his second term when condemnation can no longer protect him even when he was elected in 2023. Let me stand corrected here. Say, Lorenzo can be criminally prosecuted because what is being referred to in the condemnation is administrative uh, offense. Now, if it is a criminal offense, the condonation doctrine does not apply <laughs> criminally. Pero pag administrative, uh, pwede. No? E dito, uh, what, what happened was, uh, he was elected, he was re-elected in the 2023 election. No? Uh, and that is his third term. And supposedly, the offense, uh, administrative offense uh, that is being lab labeled on him, happened before 2023. That means on his second term. Now, when he says now, but you know, you cannot charge me because I was re-elected. Eh. And now you say, hindi eh. Kasi when you committed the administrative uh, uh, offense, uh, uh, the, 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 the condonation doctrine was no longer in place. Why? Kasi you were in position, uh, say 2022 is your last year. And if you have a three-year term, that means uh, 12 plus three, from 2019 to 22, 2022 was the period of the administrative offense. And so if it is 2019, you know, the, the, the condonation doctrine expired already in 2016. So any administrative offense that you commit after 2016 will no longer be protected by the condonation doctrine. So you are being sued for that period from 2016, uh, from 2019 to 2022, now in 2023. You can no longer use the 2023 as a condonation of your administrative failure in, 20, in 2019 to 2022. Then 2016, there is no more any condonation. Okay? In the case of Aldrin Madreo versus Byron, a 2020 decision, and also in the case of Ombudsman uh, against the same Byron in the same year of 2020, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to say that the condominium doctrine still applies to those officials who elected prior to the abandonment, uh, uh, prior to its abandonment in 2016. So, if you were holding office in 2016, and uh, the supposed administrative 
offense was committed during that period no? inabutan ng abandonment then you will still be benefited by your re-election to the subsequent term. A public official already re-elected prior to the finality of Carpio Morales, that is uh, the case of the abandonment of the condemnation, has every right to rely on the old doctrine that his election served as a condemnation of his previous misconduct, cutting the right to remove him from office, and that is the current office that is after the term uh, of 2016. So the offense was committed in that period of 2016 when, when the condemnation doctrine was abandoned. No? Uh, was abandoned. So, wala nang protection ng condemnation. And you committed the administrative offense during that period. But you were ele- re-elected no? uh, on the term subsequent to 2016. So, kung natapos yan 2022, and you were re-elected in 2022, uh, teka, kung 2016 ang inabot, no? uh, we, we do not know if we ca- how many years, kasi sabi dito 2022. So, pabalik 3 years 2019. So, kung pabalik, no? 19 minus 3 is 16, exactly. No? 16. So, yung 2016 to 2019, if the offense was or was committed, the administrative was committed at that point, wala nang benefit ang condonation doctrine because 2016 kinat na eh. So, kung nagawa niya yung kasalanan niya 2016 to 2019, yung kasalanan niya yun, no, in election ng 2020, uh, 2019, uh, 2016 to 2019, binoto siya 2019 to 2022. Doon, no, hindi na siya lulusot because the 2016 to 2019 was no longer covered by the condonation doctrine. Okay? So, ito sabi rito, a public official already re-elected prior, uh, re-elected prior uh, the finality of Carpio Morales has every right to rely on the old doctrine that his re-election served as a condonation of his previous misconduct, cutting the right to remove him from office. Once re-elected, the public official has a vested right not to be removed from office under the condonation doctrine, which cannot be divested or impaired by a new law or doctrine without violating the Constitution. Hindi po pwede na mangyayari dito, eh, ex post facto lo na mangyayari because at the time you committed the criminal offense, ang sinasabi, pag binoto ka yung susunod na term, pardon ka na by the issue of the condonation doctrine. Ngayon, hindi po pwede na itong pardon mo itatanggalin by retroaction na paparusahan ka na. But watch out on the timetable. Dapat 2016 ang reference point. If the criminal, if the administrative offense was committed uh, uh, on or before 2016, the subsequent election after 2016 will still allow the uh, condonation doctrine to operate. But after that period, isang period na lang yun, yung susunod na boto na naman siya, gumawa na naman siya ng administrative kasalanan noon, ay mapaparusahan na siya. Or doon niya ginawa yung kanyang kasalanan. Mapaparusahan na. That's why, you know, I, I, I'll be very honest with you. I was not very familiar on the cut-offs. I was familiar with the principle, but when this was given, I had to, to revisit uh, this, this uh, decided cases, Madreo versus Byron. And that's when I started understanding. And so if I can explain a little better now in this particular sharing, it is because I knew the principle, but I did not know the refinement of how it is to be implemented until now. And so this is also my little privilege of having to share with you something because I cannot share with you something that I don't have. So I needed to study this when I saw this particular problem. Ang ganda-ganda naman po ng batas natin. No, no? Oo. And uh, uh, let, let, let's take a look at uh, there, there are some more uh, suggestions. Eh. Sasabihin eh, eh ba't nga ba inimbento yung condonation doctrine? Ano naman ang kabutihan nun? Okay, let's take a look. In the case of Pascual versus the Provincial Board of Nueva Ecija, a 1959 decision, hindi matagal, no? Kasi matagal na itong condonation doctrine. Ang sinabi, the condonation doctrine provides that an elected public official cannot be removed 
for administrative misconduct. Take note, ha? Administrative misconduct, no? Committed during a prior term. So, ngayon ka pinapa, ano, ngayon ka ngayon hinahabla, pero yung administrative misconduct, yung previous term. Okay. Now, his election to office, no? meaning your, your current term, uh, operates as a condonation of the officer's previous misconduct to the extent of cutting off the right to, to remove him, therefore. Okay. So that is decided in the case, a celebrated case dito, yung Pascual versus the Nueva Ecija, a 1959 decision. But reiterated in the case of Aguinaldo versus Santos, a 1992 decision. In the case of Salalima versus Gingona, a later 1996 decision, the Supreme Court revisited this and explained that the condonation doctrine is founded on the theory that an official's re-election expresses the sovereign will of the electorate. Yun ang gusto ng tao eh. No, napatawarin siya eh. No? To forgive or condone any act or omission constituting a ground for administrative discipline. Take note ha? administrative discipline committed during his previous term. Condonation is sound public policy to endless partisan uh, contests between the re-elected official and his political enemies for acts committed during his previous term. Oh, naaboto ka nga ngayon. Kung wala condonation to Krim, no? Yahalo ka rin yung, yung performance mo in the past na effectively pinatawad ka ng tao Pero without the condonation to create, kukulitin ka ng kukulitin ng tao. And uh, if this were a small community, nakakairita. Now, when you remove the condonation to create, and you have more people now, it is possible that the people were not so aware of what was happening in your previous term. So pag pinukpo ka ngayon at pwede kang maparosahan, no, eh, maganda na yun. Not, not to mention that it becomes very interesting because now incumbent officials will be Concern about the penalty of, uh, for example, of the ouster. O, o, o eh, meron pa yung recall election. O, so, yung recall election, kung nanalo ko sa recall election, it is almost at the month also to condonation. The doctrine of forgiveness, so yun ay ibig sabihin ng condonation. The doctrine of forgiveness or condonation cannot apply to criminal acts committed during his previous term. So, pag meron ng graft and corruption dyan, di ba? Meron ng theft, meron ng robbery, what have you, hindi nakasama yung doon sa ano, administrative ano lang, uh, offense, okay? Condonation doctrine does not apply to appointed officials. Ayan! Only elected officials. But appointed officials can still be uh, sued, no? Because in the case of appointed officials, you were not bound to answer to the sovereign will of the people who voted for you. Because you were not voted upon. Yun ang lesson nung, nung coordination decree. May nagpatawad sa'yo, yung mga tao. But when you're appointed, no, and you committed an administrative, uh, let's say, malfeasance, then you, you, the, the people did not forgive you or could not forgive you no, if you were reappointed or appointed or reappointed. No? Because... There is nothing to, to uh, do, sabi nga eh, you, you have no need for utang na loob sa mga tao na pinatawad ka. And so you can be crim- you can be administratively prosecuted. Ang ganda, no? Oh, napakaganda. That is the reason why, uh, <clears throat> just a side comment, I have noticed a number of people, including law students, who would always like to make philosophical views about law. No, makakita lang ng provision of law, principle of law, magdi-debate, di-debate. Alam nyo, marami ng philosophy yung law. No, pag nilagay doon, the people who, 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 who created those legal doctrines must have already contributed their own share of philosophies. And in the study of law, we are not in the process initially you know, when the law is there dura lex and lex that is the law when the law is there you know the first thing we should know is understand the law and use the law it is only when you perceive that the law is not fair do you now try to find a deeper philosophical view 
Yung iba hindi eh. Nakakita ng batas, mamimiloso pa ng sarili nila without understanding the batas. Ito ang problema. When that particular person is a student, kukuha ng bar, daladala niya yung mentality na kahit anong pinag-aralan niya, siya mamimiloso po. No? So, bibigyan siya ng problem na katulad ng condonation. Mangangatwi rin siya ng sarili niyang philosophy. Di sa kanya tama yung philosophy niya at tama yung sagot niya. Then, bumagsak sa bar. Then, lalapit sa akin. Din, bakit naman ganun? Tama naman yung sagot ko. Bakit bumagsak ako? Oh, dos mga ganun sagot ko. Eh, I know how it is because when I entered law school, And I was not new in law because I have very good performance uh, in the College of Business with a number of commercial law subjects and taxation and political science. So I thought all along I knew a lot of things no? already. But when I finally reached the College of Law, I came to realize that I am studying law precisely to determine what the law is and why is the law there in accordance with how it was placed there. It was not my mission to look at the law and start evaluating ano dapat yung pilosopo nung batas na yon ayon sa aking pananaw. Hindi. The law is there like condonation because somebody put it there and gave reasoning. And so as a student of law, I should know what the law is, no? Dural exedles and the reason that was put there. So that when that particular problem is confronting us in an actual litigation, then we know what the purpose of the law is all about and we reconcile that with the objective of our client. No. Now, if in reality nakita natin na eh, ito yung batas, ito yung reasoning ng mga gumawa ng batas na yun, pero disintonado yung ano, then we go into a second round of uh, exercise where We make proposals now. No, we we submit our proposal to our uh, legislative department so that they can change, amend, repeal those laws. No, in accordance with our own philosophy, saying that our philosophy is superior to the original philosophy that was put. Ito nang yari dito sa condonation. Oh, for example, yung question sa impeachment. Mamaya tatanong natin yan. Meron ding philosophy, no? Uh, na ang ganda-ganda. Mamaya natin pag-usapan when we reach the case of impeachment na sumingil yung asawa ni ni late uh, Chief Justice uh, Renato Corona na kanyang retirement. So, eh, Siyempre, pilosopo na naman. Eh, hindi na-impeach ka, hindi eh, may kasalanan nga. Sabi you no, know, therefore wala kang retirement. Eh, yun ang pilosopo mo kung hindi mo na iintindihan kung bakit nilagay yung impeachment at bakit nilagay yung retirement. That's why, when I was uh, reading it, sabi ko, eh, ito yung philosophy. Oo. Eh, hindi ngayon, pagka binigay sa bar exam, hindi ka mamimiloso pa ng sarili mo, kundi intindi mo what was the reasoning behind the law. Yun. Kaya yan ang, yan ang problema, lalo na yung mga working student na uh, masyado nagmamadali sa pag-aaral, pababaw yung pinag-aralan, No, hindi nakapag-review ng gusto, kukuha ng bar. Pag kumuha ng bar, eh, ma- yung sagot niya, hindi niya, kabisa, hindi niya master yung, yung philosophy of the law, no? hindi niya ngay- naguguluhan siya ngayon. Then, sasagutin niya based on his common sense. Yan. Yung, yung meron siyang knowledge of uh, part one and part two of the philosophy of the law. Pero hindi niya, hindi niya, na, hindi niya na master. No? Bibirahin niya ngayon ng common sense. Pagkatapos hindi tumapat yung common sense doon sa ano, doon sa logic of the law, then iiyak siya bakit siya bumagsak. Now, let us look at the full-time student. Yung full-time student, pinipwersa siya na memorize mo yung provision of the law. Di, memorize siya na memorize na memorize. Pag binigyan sa problem, lalagay niya kung ano yung pag-aralan niya. Pero kung magaling siya talaga, he goes into second step. Yung pinamemorize sa akin, bakit ba ganun yung batas na yun? Because he has more time to study. Yeah, that's the difference. Okay, nahaba natin kwentuhan, pero uh, pasensya na kayo. I, I, I really feel that there is a need for us to explain you know, in this, uh, may oras naman tayo, dahil hindi na tayo nag-ahanda sa bar exams, except for the next bar examination, who, and those who will take it are watching this. Okay, so balik tayo. 
doon sa election law. We have discussed the condonation on re-election. Now, the other one that is very interesting is when does a candidate who files a certificate of candidacy considered to be resigned from his incumbent position? So, ano siya? Incumbent siya. Meron siyang position ngayon. O, siyang incumbent mayor, congressman, o secretary, what have you, senador. Now, when he files a certificate of candidacy, when is he considered resigned from his incumbent position? Yun ang tinanong dito in the candidacy while holding office. Let's take a look. Ang ganda. And this will always be a question that will be confronting us. Okay. So, question number 18. Is resignation upon candidacy elective versus appointive officials? The question reads, Gerardo, a public official, filed a certificate of candidacy for the position of representative of the lone legislative district of his province. Despite such filing, Gerardo continued to occupy his public office since according to his lawyer, he can only be considered resigned from public office upon the commencement of the campaign period for local officials. Okay? What is the effect of the filing of certificate of candidacy by Gerardo? Explain. Now, take a look. Huh? Siya is a public official. But take note. Was that is a press is his incumbent position a public official where he got it by election or by appointment? May affect you. Okay. Now, let's take a look. Our suggested answer is Gerardo's candidacy will allow him to continue to occupy his elective position. In other words, if his public office is an elective public office, then he can continue to occupy that elective position until the campaign period starts. So, tuloy yun. Now, when the campaign period, no, as signaled by the, uh, by the provision of law and announced by the POMELEC, then that is the time he's considered the sign from his incumbent elective position. He will be considered resigned from his incumbent elective position when the campaign for district representative starts. Ayan ha, tandaan nyo. However, in Section 4, Resolution Number 3253 on the amended rules and regulations covering the filing of certificates of candidacy as issued by the COMELEC on 2001. It says, any elective official running for any position other than the one which he is holding in a permanent capacity will be deemed resigned only upon the start of the campaign period corresponding to the position for which he is running. Now, any person holding a public appointive office, including active members of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, and other officers and employees in the government-owned or controlled corporation shall be deemed, shall be considered ipso facto resigned from his office upon the filing of his certificate of candidacy. So the simplification is look at your current office. Is your current office elective? And if the answer is yes, and you file the certificate of candidacy, for another office, or oh, supposedly elective, then you can continue to occupy your office. No? Oh, pwede yung senador, congressman, governor, mayor, board member, you know, and all of this. You can continue to, to perform that elective function until election campaign. So pagdating ng election campaign, tigil ka na, resign ka na sa position mo, tigil ka na sa pagtatrabaho. Now, second scenario, your position is an appointed position. Yeah, like for example, you are the sec executive secretary, secretary of DNR, secretary of national defense. Now, the moment you file your certificate of candidacy to run for, for example, senator, to run for congressman, to run for governor, for mayor, then your act of filing your certificate of candidacy and you're occupying a, an appointed position, automatically you are considered resigned 
from your appointee position. Yan ang napakaganda ng provision. Ha? Okay, napakalinaw at very, very important for us to understand. Okay? I do not know whether there is an extra paragraph on that one. Okay, wala. So, balik natin yung yun, candidacy. We go back to that. And we go back to our module on election laws. Nandito na tayo sa election law. Na-cover na natin yung condonation. Na-cover na natin yung uh, candidacy, uh, the filing of the certificate of candidacy while holding either an appointee, an elective or appointee position. Punta na tayo ngayon doon sa simple yung biometrics ng COMELEC. Sabi ng iba, eh, you're requiring us to register uh, under the biometrics uh, mechanism. That's a violation of uh, the requirement on the constitution on uh, qualification of a registered voter. Okay. Tingnan natin kung ano sasabihin. The problem in the area of the COMELEC biometrics runs this way. On the voter's registration, excuse me ha, kumisa hmm, nakakainip din ng, ng nagdidictate kang ganito. So problem number 17 on the voter's registration, specifically on the biometrics, runs this way. Congress enacted a law providing for mandatory biometrics voter registration. The Commission on Elections then issued resolutions implementing said law and further providing that registered voters who fail to submit their biometrics for validation by the last day of filing of application for registration for the May 2025 elections shall be deactivated. Consequently, those who fail to be validated, those without biometrics data, or those who have incomplete biometrics data will be deactivated and shall not be allowed to vote. A petition for certiorari and prohibition was filed before the Supreme Court assailing the constitutionality of the law and the COMELEC resolutions on the ground that biometrics validation constitutes an additional and substantial qualification not contemplated by the 1987 Constitution because non-compliance therewith results in voter deactivation. Will the petition prosper? Explain briefly. Our suggested answer. No, the petition versus the biometrics validation will not prosper. <clears throat> the biometrics registration is not a liter literacy, property, or other substantive requirement which propagates a socio-economic standard <clears throat> with no rational basis to a person's ability to intelligently cast his vote and to further the public good. Let us understand that. Here, the Supreme Court is saying that if the requirement for registration or re-registration involves a socio-economic standard but it does not uh, define that a, a voter can intelligently cast his vote. Mano, may standard yun. Pero hindi naman para testing in kung intelligent yung tao to cast his vote. Okay? Then, that particular requirement is not violative of the Constitution. So, yung biometric sabi, hindi naman yung literacy requirement yan. No, sinasabi lang naman. Ano ba sinasabi rito na kailangan sabihin mo? No? <clears throat> uh, dito, uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether it is uh, listed here. No? For example, yung name mo, iba, yung, uh, and all of these requirements in biometrics. No? Uh, yung height mo, siguro, yung, yung ano mo, uh, uh, certain characteristics. Hindi ra yung literacy standard. Kasi ang literacy standard ang read and write. Eh. It is not a property standard. Hindi naman tinatanong kung mara marami kang pera o mahirap ka lang. Or 
there is no other substantive requirement that is being asked. Yung nasabi yun, bigay mo yung biometrics mo. Yung biometrics mo naman, hindi naman socioeconomic standard yun. And uh, hindi naman yung requirement para to determine whether you can intelligently vote. Hindi. So, hindi additional requirement. And so, it can be implemented uh, without violating the Constitution. Sorry. <clears throat> and uh, if I'm not mistaken, wala na. No? Kasi gumalaw na yung ano eh. So, so, walang violation. Di yung, yung biometrics. And finally, under the election law, the Bangsamoro is organized along parliamentary lines. Parliamentary procedure, ano sila? Parliamentary setup. So, they have a parliament. Instead of, well, uh, kung parliament sila, mangyayari ngayon yung, yung chairman nung, nung uh, Bangsamoro is uh, parang in effect a prime minister who is coming from the parliament. Ang tanong ngayon, eh, yung parliament na yun, para maging membro ka, dapat pumasa ka doon sa electoral tribunal nila. Ang tanong, pwede ba silang gumawa ng sarili nila electoral tribunal? This is what is being asked. And in my case, I was a little, uh, uh, bakit may sarili sila? Okay, and if you go to the direct, direct to the question, it says, Bangsamoro Parliament Electoral Tribunal. The problem number five reads, Section 1, Article 4 on Bangsamoro Parliamentary, Parliament Electoral Tribunal of the Proposed Electoral Code of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Muslim Mindanao State. Section 1, Creation and Jurisdiction. The Bangsamoro Parliament shall have an electoral tribunal we shall be the sole judge of all contests relating to the election, returns, and qualifications of the members of the parliament. So, meron tayo yung mga Muslim brothers natin, tatayin yung same parliament, magbobotoan. Pag naboto ngayon, yung question ng qualification, doon ngayon i-resolve within their parliament by creating their own electoral tribunal. Yun lang ang magiging, cover, uh, yun ang magiging resource if somebody would like to question the qualification of a member of parliament. Okay. Is the proposed provision constitutional? Ang sagot niya nito. Yes, the Bangsamoro Parliament, parliament Electoral Tribunal is constitutional. It has the same structure as the House Electoral Tribunal. Ganun din sa Congress. Hindi ka naniniwala na itong congressman na ito deserving no, by, by way of missing qualification, then you file a case against him on the House Electoral Tribunal. Ganon din naman sa Senate. Kaya lang, ang composition, siyempre, dinefined. Katulad sa Senate, merong miyembro ron ng tatlong, uh, tatlong justices ng Supreme Court. Okay? The same with the Presidential Electoral Tribunal. Dito sa, ano, sa Bong Samoro, nagtayo sila ng sarili nila na, ano, within the, their parliament, no? So, the Bangsamoro Bang Tribunal is subject to COMELEC jurisdiction. Kung baga sa ano, kung ano yung pag-uusapan nila ron at hindi sila nagkasundo-sundo, no, hindi naman absolutely yun ang desisyon ng, ng Electoral Tribunal ng Parliament. On appeal, they can now go to the COMELEC. And with the COMELEC still exercising appellate jurisdiction over the decision of the uh, Bangsamoro Parliament Electoral Tribunal, that particular tribunal is not unconstitutional. It is still following the structure of our national government or our constitution. Okay? So, the Bangsamoro Tribunal is subject to communal jurisdiction when the dispute is not resolved among themselves. Under Section 17, Article 6 of the Legislative Department in the Constitution says, The Senate and the House of Representatives shall each have an electoral tribunal which shall be the sole judge of all contests relating to the election, returns, and, and qualifications of the respective members. Tingnan mo, sole judge. Ginamitin dito sa uh, electoral tribunal ng Bangsamoro Parliament. Each tribunal shall be composed of nine members, three of whom shall be justices of the Supreme Court to be designated by the Chief Justice 
and the remaining six shall be members of the Senate or the House of Representatives, as the case may be, who shall be chosen on the basis of proportional representation from the political parties and the parties or organizations registered under the party list system represented therein. The senior justice is the electoral tribunal shall be its chairman. So the, the Senate and the uh, congressional uh, electoral tribunals have been predefined in our uh, constitution. Now, since we organize our Bangsa Moro government as an autonomous uh, region, providing them with uh, their own uh, <coughs> legislative arm, no, para rin yung provincial, no, provincial government. Ito, regional parliament. E di, kung magkakaroon ng question, saka nilang qualification, mayroon din silang sabi ng electoral tribunal. And the only important thing <coughs> is they had the deadlock. They will still be subjected to the jurisdiction of the COMELEC. Yun ang importante dito sa issue na ito. And so, it is uh, constitutional. There. The Bangsamoro Parliament Electoral Tribunal has a proposed electoral code of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Mr. Mindanao. The uh, Bangsamoro Parliament shall have an electoral tribunal which shall be the sole judge. So, the electoral tribunal shall be composed of the chief electoral officer, a sex office chairman, two retired judges of any of the regional trial courts in the bar MM of proven competence, integrity, etc., and then decisions of the PA on all contests relating to election returns, qualification of members of parliament shall be appealable to the COMELEC. This is the saving grace that they continue to respect the uh, constitution because the ultimate review will be uh, by way of an independent constitutional body under uh, uh, which is the COMELEC. Okay? So that essentially is uh, the coverage of the questions, four questions under the election law. Now, we'll, let's now go now to our master schedule. We've already covered nine questions. And so, three are coming up from the executive department and three from the local government. Then two from the public international law and tigi isa dun sa principles and state policies, isa sa legislature, isa sa judiciary. Let's take a look at the executive department. What were the three or what are the three questions that were raised on the provisions of the constitution on the executive department? The first is the term of office. Siyempre, di ka nang pwedeng pumasa sa bar kung hindi mo alam anong term of office ng presidente or yung, yung vice president. Second, what about the pardoning power of the president? Is that subject to review? Especially in the grant of amnesty. And third, if there is a, a violation of the admission examination for police officers, who has jurisdiction? Is it the NAPOLCOM or the Civil Service Commission? Okay, so let's take a look at the term of office as a question. Problem number three in the bar reads like this, term of office, re-election. In the 2022 elections, the formidable tandem of Priscilla and Teodoro ran for and won as president and vice president, respectively, of the Republic of the Philippines. On the 15th month in office, President Priscilla suddenly resigned due to health reasons, paving the way for the vice president Teodoro to assume office as president. President Teodoro then nominated incumbent Senator Angel who was President of the Philippines from 2010 to 2016 to take his place as Vice President. Voting separately and by the vote of a majority of all the members of both house, houses of the Congress, Senator Angel was confirmed and henceforth assumed office as the Vice President. In the incoming 2028 elections, may both President Teodoro and Vice President Angel legally run for President of the Philippines. Explain your answer with me. Our suggested answer, both President Chodoro and Angel 
cannot legally run for Philippine president. No president is eligible for any re-election. For Chidoro, he has served for more than four years as having succeeded Priscilla on the 15th month in office. So here, ang tinatanong si Chidoro at si Angel. Si Angel was already president for six years, no, from 2010 to 2016. No more opportunity to uh, be uh, to, to run again for president. In the case of Chidoro, he occupied the position for more than four years kasi umalis ng 15th month eh. Hindi ba first, uh, first uh, two years is 24 months. So sumobla na sa four years, no? He occupied the uh, third year up to the sixth year. Tapos a portion pa, no? Of the, ano, uh, no? 15 uh, month, 12 minus on the 15th month in office. So meron siyang yung first 12 months uh, in office niya, one year. May naiwan pa na three, three months. So March of the second year nun bumitaw yung si President Priscilla so nag-take over si Chudoro. So Chudoro was uh, as on the second year was nine months and then he occupied yung third year, fourth year, more than four years yun. So he cannot also run for president. The president shall not be eligible for any re-election. No person who has succeeded as president and has served as such for more than four years shall be qualified for election to the same office at any time. So that is in Section 4, Article 7. And some of you are thinking, eh, paano yung si Priscilla kung gumaling? Can he run for president? The answer, the president shall not be eligible for re-election. He, and Priscilla was already elected. Uh, and uh, the fact that she resigned did not change the fact that she was elected. And if she files a, a, her candidacy, saying that she only occupied the position for 15 months. That will not cure the uh, situation that she was already president. So, uh, hindi tinanong yan dito. Pero just in case, uh, if you're wondering, then my position is the uh, resigned president for 50, who served for 15 months can no longer be, uh, can, can no longer run for the presidency because that will be tantamount to re-election. So that is the question on term of office. Next, we have the president's pardoning power. The second question under the executive department on pardoning power, that is uh, problem number four, uh, reads like this. In a fresh attempt by the president to seek a just and lasting peace, with the Kapisana ng Malayang Pilipinas. A government negotiating panel, GNP, was constituted to explore options to end the internal armed conflict in the country. After months of negotiations, the GNP and the KMP leadership agreed on the crucial provision in the chapter on transitional justice of the agreed framework, which states, the parties hereby recognize the need to arrive a genuine criminal justice. Towards this end, the GNP shall make the appropriate representation with the Senate and the House of Representatives aimed at the passage of an amnesty law. The Philippine Constitution Association questioned the provision as unconstitutional for encroaching on the clemency power of the President. On the other hand, the Office of the Solicitor General argued that the present case does not present a justiciable controversy. Who is correct? Explain your answer. Our suggested answer. The GNP can ask Congress to enact an amnesty law, which is not encroaching on the president's clemency power. Majority of Congress needs to concur when the president grants an amnesty. Ang sinasabi natin dito, if uh, the government panel will uh, go to Congress to ask for an amnesty law. The uh, president, uh, the president clemency power is not being compromised because if we reverse the process, it was the president who is granting amnesty. No? Then Congress has also uh, has still to concur. And that is not an understate, uh, that is not encroaching on the president's uh, clemency power. So, balik tarin natin. Gumawa naman ng amnesty law yung, yung, 
uh, Congress. No? Uh, that itself is not also an encroachment on the clemency power of the President when the amnesty law was granted. The Solicitor General is correct in that there is no signed agreed framework as an independent source of obligation. The binding prestation to, give, to do or give and the corollary right to exact compliance is not present. And in Section 19, Article 7 on the Executive Department, it reads, Except in cases of impeachment or as otherwise provided in the Constitution, the President may grant reprieves, commutations, and pardons and remit fines or forfeitures after conviction by final judgment. He shall also have the power to grant amnesty with the concurrence, or look, with the concurrence of a majority of all the members of Congress. Lalapit pa rin siya sa Congress. So in reality, in the present constitution, the president doesn't exercise absolute power of clemency. Dahil kailangan niya may two majority vote noong uh, Congress. E kung binaligtad natin na yung Congress naman ang gumawa ng law, still in all, the president will have to approve because it is a law. And so the answer is, uh, ang, ang tanong dito, who is correct? The Philippine Constitution Association, pareho naman silang correct. Ano, hindi naman pinayo pinapipili. Okay? So with this, uh, there is an additional comment here that says, the uh, MOA ad is not a document. Yung, yung pinag-usapan nila. And this is based on the case of the province of North Cotabato versus the uh, Republic of the Philippines in the area of the Peace Panel na nag-uusap na yung ancestral domain. So napag-usapan to, no, in 2008. The MOA ad is not a document but a piece of paper which the parties cannot look up to as an independent source of obligation. Kwento-kwento lang eh. Sinula. Okay. The binding prestation to give at to do or give and the corollary right to exact compliance. The unsigned draft of MOA ad cannot be for judicial review because there is there before the court no actual case or justiciable controversy ripe for adjudication. A justiciable controversy involves a definite and concrete dispute touching on the legal relations of parties due to their demanding and conflicting legal interests. And a dispute is for adjudication when the act being challenged has a direct adverse effect on the person challenging it and admits of a specific relief through a decree that is conclusive in character. In the, in the case of the uh, so-called positioning here in this negotiation, it was really more of ano, ito, eh, nakalagay, oh, uh, transitional justice of the agreed framework. Transitional justice. So, ano lang ito, parang preparatory. So, it will not be a source of any justiciable uh, case. Okay. So, moving now to the last question, which is on the issue of the DILG. Who has authority if there is cheating in the examination for police officers? Okay. In the case of uh, problem number six, it talks about the Civil, Civil Service Commission, and the DILG, Napolcom, and PNT. The question runs like this. Hector, a government employee, asked Ignacio to take the police officer one examination in his behalf. Upon investigation, the Civil Service Commission observed that the picture of Hector and signature in the application form and seat plan were not identical with those found in his personal data sheet. Thus, the CSC concluded that Hector conspired with Ignacio by allowing the latter to impersonate him and found him guilty of dishonesty, meeting out the penalty of dismissal. Hector appealed his dismissal to the Court of Appeals. He argued that the CSC has been divested of its authority and jurisdiction to conduct investigations and render administrative decisions based on alleged anomalies in police entrance and promotional examinations after the effectivity of Republic Act Number 8551 or the Philippine National Police Reform and Reorganization Act. The law transferred the power to administer and conduct entrance 
and promotional examinations to police officers from the CSC to the National Police Commission based on the standards set by the latter. Is Hector correct? Explain. Our suggested answer, no. Hector is not correct. The Civil Service Commission continues to undertake disciplinary action on cheating in examinations it undertakes to protect the integrity of the Civil Service Commission. While it is true na nilipat sa, ano, ano, sa na, na Polcom, at the time the cheating happened, it was still the Civil Service Commission that was undertaking it, either with the approval or the tolerance of the Napolcom. Eh, sanay naman ang, ang Civil Service doon. So sabi siguro Napolcom, eh kayo na muna magtuloy. Or kahit na under sa guideline namin, you can still be the warm body to execute the exam, actual examination. The CSC has the duty, authority, and power to administer the civil service system and protect its integrity by removing from the list of eligible those who falsify their classification. Sila nakahuli eh, ang, ang uh, Civil Service Commission. And it is their duty to, to uh, remove those who are cheating. Cheating is to be distinguished from the ordinary proceedings to discipline uh, a bona fide member, na, not member, a bona fide member for acts or omissions which violate the law or the rules of the service. Even on its own, the Civil Service Commission can take necessary action because in the overall, civil service examinations continue to be under the uh, clear responsibility of the civil service. Kaya kung nailipat yun, pero may nahuli sila at sila kasi nagkakandak noon, it will still be binding for them to discipline those uh, cheating. Uh, members of the uh, examination uh, group. Okay. So that essentially covers the question, the three questions on the executive department. And if we go back now to our uh, mother uh, schedule, that now leaves us, the local government, with three questions likewise. And if we go now to the local government, <coughs> The three questions on the local government is the creation of a province, the MWSS sewage concession, and hospital bills, whether it be processed by the COA or the courts. Okay. Now, let us first go into the creation of a province. The question on the creation of a province is in problem number 19 in the bar examination. And the problem reads, the island of Coron belongs to the province of Palawan. The Bureau of Local Government Finance certified that the average annual income of the island of Coron based on the 1991 constant prices was 82.7 million. Based on the latest census of population and housing conducted by the Philippine Statistics Authority, the population of Coron is 371,576 while its land area is 802.12 square kilometers as certified by the Land Management Bureau. Republic Act Number 222 was enacted by Congress creating the province of Coron Islands and as of was approved by the President. Thereafter, a plebiscite was held which yielded 69,940 affirmative votes and 63,502 negative votes. Is the creation of the province of Coron Island consistent with the requirements under Section 10, Article 10 of the 1987 Constitution and Section 461 of the Local Government Code? Explain briefly. Our suggested answer is no. Coron creation did not meet the 2,000 square meters territory kasi 802,000 kilometers lang yung territory niya. Under Section 10, Article 10 of the Constitution, it says, No province, city, municipality, or barangay may be created, divided, merged, abolished, or its boundaries substantially altered, except in accordance with the criteria established in the local government code and subject to approval by the majority votes in votes cast in a plebiscite in the political units directly affected. Wala namang problema yung majority vote eh, na hit. No? Pero, in Section 46 of 
the local government code, Republic Act 7160. It says that a province may be created, divided, merged, abolished, or its boundary substantially altered only by an act of Congress and subject to approval by the majority of the votes cast in a plebiscite to be conducted by the COMELEC in the local government unit or units directly affected. Now, ito na ngayon. Under the same local government code, the local government code now defined the requisites as to average annual income. No? E dito 20 million, nahit nila 82 million. Uh, and then number two, yung contiguous area, 2,000 square meters. E yun na measure, e 802 lang. And then finally, the population at less than 250,000. Okay naman sila, 371,000. So that in reality, what is now missing is uh, hindi na meet yung ano, hindi na meet yung, sabi nga rito, did not meet the 2,000 square meters territory. Kasi dito minimum yun eh. Under, Republic, under Section 461, dito 802. So the answer is no, Koron did not meet that particular requirement. So it will not assume the position. Kaya ngayon nata, hanggang ngayon, Koron is still part of Palawan. It's not an independent uh, province. And finally, I would consider the most difficult question uh, in the bar exam is the question on MWSS seaweeds concession. Tingnan natin. Under this particular problem, number 13, water concessionaire, sewage and wastewater treatment. The problem reads, Maasikaso Water Company, MWC. A private concessionaire entered into a 25-year concession agreement in 2009 with the Metropolitan Waterworks and Seaweed System for the delivery of water supply, wastewater, and sanitation services in the city of Manila. In 2019, residents of Manila filed the complaints against MWC with the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Pollution Adjudication Board, for the violation of the Clean Water Act. The residents allege that the severe flooding in Manila and worsening pollution in Manila Bay had been due to the failure of MWC to provide for adequate sewage and or septage treatment facilities as mandated under the concession agreement. MWC countered that the primary duty to construct sewage and or septage treatment facilities rests upon the local government unit under Section 7 of the CWA, which states, Each LGU shall appropriate the necessary land, including rights of way, road access to the land, for construction of the sewage and or septic treatment facilities. NWC does maintain that it must be absolved from any form of liability considering that the City of Manila clearly failed to comply with Section 7 of the Clean Water Act, CWA. Is MWC correct? Explain. Our explanation. No, MWC is not correct. Its contractual obligation under its concession on connecting existing sewage lines with the centralized sewage system which they are, they are to provide, was not complied with. Kung baga sa ano dito, ang nakalagay, no? Uh, the, the, the MWC, the concessionaire, is supposed to provide the adequate sewage and septage treatment facilities. Sila yon dapat, no? At dapat, yung mga nasa subdivision, si mga kung saan saan bayan-bayan, i-connect nila dun sa sarili nila gagawin na sewage system. Okay. Now, the need for the LGU, sabi, sabi rito, its contractual obligation under its concession on connecting existing sewage lines with a centralized sewage system which they are to provide was not complied with. Hindi nila naibigay yung centralized sewage system. The need for the LGUs to provide land 
to enable MWC to make the needed connection is not a condition precedent for MWC. They could have connected even without the, connect, the, the land connection. In fact, if they connected, that would have put pressure on the local governments now to give the land. Eh, hindi. Hindi sila kumilos. Hindi rin kumilos yung LGU. No? And hindi sinasabi na pag hindi kumilos yung LGU, hindi concession, libre na yung MWC. While the LGUs must have failed in providing the land for the road access to the centralized sewage system, MWC could have created the environment. Kung ginawa nila yung sewage system, mape-pressure yung LGU no? for the LGU to comply with providing the land. Lalagyan lang naman ng land para may daanan yung sewage system. Eh. No? Okay? So, uh, here, there is a additional note here. In the case of Manila Water Service versus DNR, a 2019 decision, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to say that Section 8 RA 9265 states that within five years following the effectivity of this code, the agency vested to provide water supply and sewerage facilities and or concessionaires in Metro Manila and either highly urbanized cities no, in coordination with the LGUs shall be required to connect the existing sewage line found in all subdivisions. Yung mga subdivisions eh, condominiums, commercial centers, hotels, sports, recreational facilities, hospital, marketplaces, etc. No? Have their own, uh, what do you call this, uh, sewage system. No? At ang trabaho ng, mga, ng concessioner is i-connect lang yung sa kanilang central with all of these house uh, households uh, uh, connections available provided they have their sewage system. Eh, nandun nga yung mga, ano, mga subdivision, mga locals and so on. Hindi naman nagtayo ng sewage system yung uh, NWC. So, ang ultimate uh, reckoning point nito, yung mga, ano, yung concessioner na hindi niya tinupad, yung usapan niya doon sa uh, concessional agreement. Okay. So that is essentially the question on the local government. And uh, if we move now again to our master schedule, we have only three more questions. The first question is something to do with the legislature. Dito sa legislature, ang tanong lang dito, hindi naman mahirap. Under uh, question number two in the bar exams, the special election discretionary authority. It says, Sulu 2nd District, Representative Alfonso died during the second year of his term. House Speaker Rodil then designated Sulu 1st District Representative Maidas as the legislative caretaker for the remaining period of the term of Alfonso. Upon the prodding of majority of the constituents of the Sulu 2nd District who are invoking the right of representation, the members of the party of Alfonso filed the petition before the Supreme Court for the issuance of a writ of, of mandamus to compel Rodil to call for a special election in the district. Will the petition prosper? Explain. Our suggested answer is no, the petition will not prosper. The Constitution granted the Speaker, House of Representatives, the discretionary power whether or not to call a special election to fill the vacancy. The Supreme Court exercises no constitutional authority to order a co-equal branch of government, the legislature, to exercise a discretionary authority. According to the Public Act 6645 of 1987, once a vacancy occurs in the House of Representatives at least one year before the next scheduled election, the Commission on Elections upon receipt of a resolution from the chamber where the vacancy occurred shall schedule a special election. The special election will then be held at earlier than 45 days at later than 90 days from the date of the resolution, which means there has to be a resolution from the Speaker of the House of Representatives. In 1991, Republic Act 7166 was formulated to say, when a vacancy in the House of Representatives occurs at least one year 
before the expiration of the term. Ito, second year siya na ano eh. Second year siya namatay eh, yun no? Second year. The expiration of the term. The special election shall be held not earlier than 60 days nor later than 90 days after occurrence of the vacancy. Pero merong additional provision under Section 9 of Article 6 of the Legislative Department of the Constitution. In case of vacancy in the Senate or in the House of Representatives, a special election may be called, that's when the decision is, to fill such vacancy in the manner prescribed by law, but the senator or member of the House of Representatives thus elected shall serve only for the unexpired term. Ito ang mabigat. Under Section 5 of Rule 2, Membership under the rules of the House of Representatives in the 18th Congress says, In case a member dies, resigns, is permanently incapacitated or lawfully barred from performing the duties of a member or is lawfully removed from office, vacancies may be filled as follows. A. For vacancies in the representation of legislative districts, special elections shall be called to fill the vacancies. And B. For vacancies in the representation of party lists, party list representatives may be chosen to fill the vacancies in the manner provided by law. Now, a member elected or designated to fill a vacancy shall serve only for the duration of the unexpired term. Now, so that therefore, at the end of the day, the question on whether or not the uh, legislature is bound to help a special election. First, the one who will conduct the special election is Comilek. But Comilek cannot act without the resolution from the uh, Congress. And that will come from the initiative of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Historically, hindi nagpapa special election yung ano eh. Ina-appoint lang yung kapitbahay na congressman. Kaya dito, ina-appoint yung, ano, yung first district, the second district, yung namatayan. Ganun lang ginagawa. Okay? So, uh, that is on the uh, legislature. Second to the last question will be on the judiciary. Ito, napakaganda na ang issue dito. Uh, and I personally also feel good that I, I have learned some additional inputs on impeachment. Problem number 15 says that impeachment is not a punishment. And there is a retirement for the impeached justice. Let's look at the problem. Filed before the House of Representatives were articles of impeachment against Chief Justice Orduha for corruption, betrayal of public trust, and culpable violation of the Constitution. After a heavily publicized trial, the Senate sitting as impeachment court rendered a judgment removing Orduha from her position with the additional penalty of disqualification to hold any other public office. However, during dependency of the criminal, administrative, and civil cases subsequently filed against her, Orduha died due to health complications. The heirs of Orduha filed a petition before the Supreme Court for the release of her accrued retirement benefits and other gratuities as a member of the judiciary. Senate President Francisco opined that the petition of the heirs of Orduha should be denied in view of her removal by impeachment. Is Francisco correct? Decide with reasons. Our suggested answer, no. Francisco is not correct. Justice Orduha's heir shall receive the accrued retirement benefits. Orduha's impeachment does not constitute a penalty as conviction for any criminal, administrative, and civil cases. He would have been entitled to retirement pay, which his heirs may receive in the event he dies. And he did. In the letter of Mrs. Maria Cristina Rocco Corona to the Supreme Court in 2021, the Supreme Court did the opportunity to rule. Impeachment is to remove the impeachable officer from office, not punish him. It is purely political, and it is neither civil, criminal, nor administrative in nature. No legally actionable liability attaches 
to the public officer by a mere judgment of impeachment against him or her. And thus lies the necessity for a separate conviction for charges that must be properly filed with the court of law. So hindi porque in-impeach mo, sinabi na na uh, convicted dyan for crime, criminal, administrative, and civil obligation. Hindi, tinanggal lang siya no, sa, sa office. Okay. Continuing now, impeachment is purely a political proceeding not to punish an offender but to secure the state against gross political misdemeanors. Impeachment neither touches his person nor his property but simply divests him of his political capacity. No legally actionable liability attaches to the public officer by a mere judgment of impeachment against him or her and thus lies the necessity for a separate conviction for charges that must be properly uh, filed with courts of law. An impeached public office officer whose civil, criminal, and administrative liability was not judicially established is entitled to the retirement benefits provided under Republic Act 9946 and 8291. So, binayaran yung uh, biuda ni Chief Justice uh, Renato Corona. Okay. You know, in that particular case, eh, si the late Miriam De Consor Santiago uh, was, in pa- wa- was, was not in favor of the impeachment of, uh, of Corona. And she said, yung bang pagka hindi mo kinumpleto yung salen mo, kasing bag- bigat ba yun ng treason? Kasing bigat ba yun ng, uh, uh, yun ang yung mga mabibigat na mga offenses, sabi niya, para tanggalin mo ang isang chief justice. Pero inulit yung kaya no? Diba, inulit kay Sereno, na yung sweldo naman niya sa UP, hindi raw niya sinaman sa salin niya, tanggal din siya. You know? And uh, I personally do not have any knowledge of who initiated all of these political moves. Finally, the last question in political law has something to do with principles and state policies. This is problem number one. On the priority to health and education and tuition fee waiver and tax incentive. The problem reads, as an incentive for Filipino nurses to remain or be employed in the Philippines, the NARS Incentive Act of 2023 was approved by the President. The law allows children of any nurse to be enrolled in any private tertiary institution without need of taking any entrance examination provided the child maintains the required passing average grade each year. A 70% tuition waiver for each child shall be extended by the institution and 50% of the tuition waiver may be creditable to any additional national taxes owned, owed by the institution to the government. Is the law constitutional? Explain briefly. Our suggested answer is yes. The law for Filipino nurses to remain in the Philippines is constitutional. The presence of Filipino nurses here will help protect and promote the people's health. The incentives given for their children in education is consistent with the need for Philippine society to accelerate social progress when Filipinos are healthy and educated. The tax incentives for tuition fees waived recognizes the indispensable role of the private sector in encouraging private enterprise and needed investments. Under Article 15, uh, Section 15 of Article 3 of the Constitution states, the state shall protect and promote the right to health of the people and instill health consciousness among them. And that is what will be achieved when more of the Filipino nurses stay here. Second, under Section 17 of the same Article 2, the state shall give priority to education, science and technology, arts, culture, and sports to foster patriotism and nationalism accelerate social progress, and promote total human liberation and development. That is consistent with giving incentive to send the children of the nurses to school. And finally, under Section 20 of the same Article 2, 
the state recognizes the ins indispensable role of the private sector, encourage private enterprise, and provides incentive to needed investment. So that is the reward of the 50% uh, of the tuition fee that was waived in favor of the uh, uh, the schools that will provide those incentives. And so with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we close our discussion on the uh, political law bar examination questions with our suggested answers to the 20 questions. And very interesting, not very easy, and there are questions that uh, without having read the decision of the Supreme Court, especially the MWSS, for example, uh, there is another case there, yung COA. We were not able to discuss that. Let me just uh, go back to that. I think we missed that. No? Uh, after MWSS, we were so excited. Yung hospital bills, whether that should be processed by COA or the courts. No? Yeah, I think we missed that. And uh, that is problem number 16 on the provincial hospital bills. Is it the COA or the courts that will uh, pro, uh, approve that? The problem reads, Bea filed a civil case for collection of a sum of money for non-payment by the province of Cagayan of various hospital supplies. It purchased from her as evidenced by invoices duly received and signed by its authorized representatives. After Bea completed the presentation of her evidence, the province moved to dismiss the case on the ground that the primary jurisdiction over her money claim belongs to the Commission on Audit, as it arose from a series of procurement transactions with the province. The trial court dismissed the case on the ground that jurisdiction over the case lies with the COA. Bea argued that the trial court erred since a collection suit is within the jurisdiction of the courts and the province belatedly invoked the doctrine. Is Bea correct? Explain. Our suggested answer, no, Bea is not correct. COA and not the courts has jurisdiction over a series of procurement transactions of Matangas. The authority and powers of COA extends to and comprehends all matters relating to the settlement of all debts and claims due from or owing to the government or any of its subdivisions, agencies, or instrumentalities. This was the pronouncement of the Supreme Court in the case of Euromed Laboratories versus Batangas, decided in 2006, and also supported by Section 26 of PD 1445, which is the governing Government Auditing Code of the Philippines. That particular uh, decision and the uh, uh, Government Auditing Code allowed the Supreme Court to say that the money claims are purchases for medical supplies of Batangas Public Hospitals. These transactions are governed by the local government code and they're implementing rules and regulations promulgated by COA under Section 383. The claims are within the knowledge, experience, expertise, and special competence of COA auditors and accountants. The doctrine of primary jurisdiction calls for the RTC to dismiss the petitioner's complaint. And so that is the uh, uh, third question on the hospital bills to be processed by COA under the local government subject matter. And therefore, with that uh, reminder, uh, we were able to complete the 20 questions that were given in political law in September 2023. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, let me now therefore move to my closing uh, page, which again reiterates my dedication to the best boss that I have worked with, who was my friend up to the time that he passed away. And I'm referring to Mr. Clemencio Peña, the President and General Manager of our company, uh, the subsidiary of FMC uh, Corporation of the USA, 
called Asia Pacific Agricultural Development Company and we were carrying that uh, granular pesticide Curadan. And I would also like to include in this dedication my dear friend, marketing manager Armando J. Acienza and our FMC Regional Director Dick Hendrickson whom I have not seen uh, for the past 23 years since he uh, went home to the U.S. Uh, Clem and Arman have passed away and I feel nostalgic trying to remember them and dedicate this particular uh, upload on political law to them even if we should, I should have probably chosen an article on uh, agriculture to dedicate it to them. Mr. Peña is a uh, professor, a product and professor of UP Diliman and later on department chair uh, in uh, UP Los Baños. Arman Achenza is a graduate of UP Los Baños, an epitome of a bright agricultural graduate of UP Los Baños, from whom I learned a lot of things, especially in the area that agricultural, uh, uh, what you call this uh, cultivation, requires the very fundamentals of the production process, including the use of statistics. You know. And so, and Mr. Peña was the best boss that I have had, and I miss him. Uh, our friendship lasted up to the time that he had to say goodbye in 2007 when he was 77 years old. And uh, he asked his uh, family to only allow two persons to speak in his way. And even if I met him purely on professional employment, our good friendship over the years came to a point where he asked his children to speak, to allow only two to say hey, goodbye to him during uh, the farewell speech on his way. And I was one of them. And I felt so touched that managed to control my tears and my crying to say goodbye to him in a beautiful way. I learned a lot uh, from Clem, and it may be too, uh, uh, too lengthy to tell the story. I will probably find an opportunity when I go to my modules on corporate uh, management to mention many of the things I learned from, from Clem, including the areas where I'm supposed to have expertise. You know. Clem told me, uh, taught me how to read the thick uh, financial reports like an aging schedule of receivables, where I gave him probably 10 to 15 pages single space uh, of each of the names of our customers alphabetically arranged. And when I gave it to him, I was surprised that he knew of 70 to 80 percent of our collectibles because he was not looking on the right side of the figure. He was looking on the left side, meaning he said, uh, you know, you accountants, you re you watch the numbers up to the centavos. I, I, I belong to the group who is not an expert in accounting. So we look at our figures on the left. And so he said, Joe, I scanned your long list. And when I look at the left, I only find the customers who have uh, where our collection is in millions and so i can re pick up 10 and i would be able to figure out you know uh, of the 10 top customers with millions i will add the millions and would be able to account for 70 to 80 percent already of our total collectibles and then we can collect from those 10 we have we have no problem and i was smiling because in spite of my mba degree from up diliman you know, and long years of experience. I did not realize what uh, Clem Peña was using is what is called the, uh, what they call the Pareto analysis. No? That 80% of your total population is accounted only by 20% of the population. So 80% of your receivables may be only due to 20 or 10 or 20 customers. And therefore, you can now go into management by exception 
by just addressing those two. That's one of the lessons I, I have. Clem is also very human. Uh, his concern for human relations is very, very high. I have not seen uh, Clem get mad or explode. But I have seen him in extreme frustration. But never uh, has he lost his, his school. And there, are, uh, there were occasions where I do make mistakes and uh, I, I would open up not knowing how to start apologizing. And it is from him I learned that even before I can even go into the details of the embarrassment that I caused, he would already be the one reciting the mistakes that I did without me saying na ito yung pagkakamali ko number one, number two, number three. He would immediately give me the impression that Joe, ito yung konting pagkakamali natin eh, iisa-isain niya by saying na hindi naman masyadong malaki itong issue na ito eh. Hindi naman malaki itong issue na ito. In other words, I don't have to even uh, ask for his forgiveness on specific things. He would already be able to pinpoint them and would say that ito yung konti nating pagkukulang. Wala namang kwenta yan eh, kasi masosolve yan eh. So to him, you know, my, to, what to me is grandiose problems become more tolerable when I'm talking to him because he doesn't make an issue out of it. I learned that from him so that when at times I am confronted even with uh, issues on legal matters, I'd be able to isolate again the more significant problem with the little problems that people get to be bothered about. Well, Dick Hendrickson is an American and he and we have very good working relationship. He liked me from the time he chose me also and uh, told Clem that he wants me. And uh, so my relationship with Dick is very close. Uh, he's an operations man and, uh, and yet I am closer to him than my own functional heads in FMC. Uh, the funny thing about it is Clem and Dick do not seem to be uh, uh, that close to each other that I become the middleman in trying to, to buffer each one. So when Dick would like to spy on Clem, I would make him believe that I am giving him inputs. And those inputs do not harm Clem. And I tell Clem about it. And so you know, we are able to reconcile. So with this, I'd like to close uh, this uh, sh sharing. Uh, I do not know that I will make a mistake in trying to, to get to uh, end this and be, uh, have it recorded. I will try to see whether I can uh, somehow save this and be able to have a good... Uh, uh, what they call this uh, recording of this particular thing. And so I am now uh, going to the file and I would not know where to put this file but let 